Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this dialogue with the Cybersecurity Agency and IMDA. This topic is data protection and your business. Our government dialogues are exclusively sponsored by Prudential Assurance, and I want to say a big thank you to Prudential for its past, current, and future support. Thank you very much. It's much appreciated. I was saying to our guest speakers just before we went live that this has been really, by a lucky accident, something of a cybersecurity week for the Chamber. Earlier in the week, we had expert speakers from Brunswick Group and Control Risks talking about cybersecurity and the board, company boards, and what they need to think about and what they need to do to drive collective accountability for the management of cybersecurity risks across their organization. And it's wonderful to have three guest speakers this afternoon um, who will take us through this topic from a practitioner's perspective, an operational perspective, and give us some more insights, advice, and guidance on the whole topic of that collective accountability and responsibility for managing cyber security risks. Our three guest speakers will speak in turn. They've each got 15 minutes or so to talk. Uh, we will start with Veronica from um, the Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore. Um, we will then have um, Justin, from uh, Rajan Tan, another very proud member of the chamber. Lovely to have you here, Justin. And finally, we will have Dominic from uh, the IMDA team, uh, Data Innovation and Protection Group. And after each of them, almost in a relay, uh, complete their addresses, uh, I'll come back to moderate the Q&A. So at any time during these three presentations, please help me as your moderator and type in your questions in the Q&A box, which you'll find in the bottom of your screens. So that's enough for me. And it's now with great pleasure that I hand you over to Veronica and she in turn will hand you over to Justin and Justin will hand you over to Dominic. So enjoy the presentations and I'll be back for the Q&A. Thank you so much, Veronica. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, Veronica from the CSA here, and I'm here to share a little bit more about CSA's efforts in helping enterprise to be cyber safe. Oops, too enthusiastic to go forward. So I think before I start, uh, just a quick introduction of what the CSA is. We are a government agency that oversees cybersecurity in Singapore. And our core mission is to help Singapore's cyberspace be safe and secure, to underpin our national security, power a digital economy, and to protect our digital way of life. In the area of national security, one area of focus important to us is to protect and to defend our critical information infrastructure. And this is to make sure that we have continuous delivery of our essential services, such as water, electricity, and so on. In the, area of in the area of digital economy, we are building a vibrant cybersecurity ecosystem. And one key effort lies in working with enterprises to raise their cybersecurity level. And I'll cover a little bit more in the presentation today. Um, in our digital way of life, we do recognize that cybersecurity is a collective responsibility. And the focus is on partnerships with industry, working together through joint outreach so that we can collectively raise awareness and promote the adoption of good cybersecurity practices. Now, digitalization has uh, vastly transformed uh, the way we work, live, learn, and transact and stay connected. And this has very much been accelerated uh, by the COVID pandemic. It creates new opportunities for businesses. But at the same time, it also has its corresponding share of cybersecurity risk. And COVID-19 has actually changed the security landscape. As all of us go online, be it in the terms of using video conferencing instead of physical meetings, um, we did so at the start of the COVID pandemic uh, in a hurry, I would say, where we had little time to stress test our systems for cybersecurity. 
As we go online more, uh, the ex there, there is an expanded uh, cyber attack surface because of the spike in online transactions, as well as in the number of devices that we're using. All these creates a fertile uh, playground for threat actors. And this has also led to um, a rise in cybersecurity incidents uh, in the past one to two years, as we have seen uh, the COVID pandemic force businesses to go online. When we talk about cybersecurity attacks, I think many enterprises will think that the larger and attractive targets uh, would be actually the large organizations. Sometimes the smaller enterprises think that they are too small to be attacked and therefore they are safe. Um, this is uh, an infographic taken off the Cyber Landscape, a report that was published by CSA earlier this year, and it covered uh, some of the top cyber threats in 2020. Ransom One was a prominent one, so I'll talk a little bit more about it here. We did see a significant increase uh, in ransomware um, in 2020, and to the point uh, that I said earlier that small enterprises are not too small to be attacked, in this case, many of the cases reported were from the SMEs. So therefore, as an enterprise, whether we're a large enterprise, um, an attractive target or the smaller ones, we should all stay vigilant. This is where CSA is leading forward to help enterprises to be cyber safe. We do recognize cybersecurity is a critical enabler to the digital economy, and we want to help businesses to build the confidence to pursue the opportunities from digitalization. However, there are also um, a cost uh, when we are impacted by cyber incidents. I was just sitting in a session yesterday, a webinar, where Frost and Sullivan was presenting some um, statistics about uh, the cost of cybersecurity. So one is obviously the direct cost uh, as a result of an impact to business operations. The other cost is um, not so clearly mentioned, but it's a clear uh, impact from the loss of trust and the business reputation perspective. So this is how and why uh, our organizations should actually try to stay cyber safe. Uh, many of you could be business leaders in the room. And um, Victor earlier mentioned that um, there was uh, an earlier session earlier this week um, talking about the business leaders. And I think we want to encourage and echo the point that business leaders would want to view cybersecurity as a business investment that pays for itself over time. Starting from the top, uh, we hope to encourage business leaders to show um, and cultivate cybersecurity leadership right from the top, uh, be the role model to be a one promoting cyber safe culture and practices in the organization. Uh, the other aspect to think about is the organization's information assets, which is in the form of the hardware, the software, and very importantly, data. What are we doing to protect our price information assets from being accessed and exploited? Um, our environment and the access to all these um, price information assets is important to think about too. This would be an uh, aspect to think about, such as secure passwords to protect them, multi-factor authentication so that you have an additional layer of protection for your assets that are important. Some of what I have covered so far are largely the preventive measures that helps to mitigate against potential attacks. Unfortunately, in the cybersecurity world, uh, the threat landscape does evolve very rapidly and cyber attackers are very quick to also evolve their techniques, which is why uh, sometimes we say that it's not a matter of if, but when. And when your business does uh, enter into a cyber incident, uh, the question is, have we put in place the right um, incident response measures to make sure that we are able to detect, respond, and more importantly, be able to recover from this business cyber attack? So far, I've covered a few measures, but I've not talked about the humans. The employees are actually the first line of defense in our organization. However, it's always um, something that uh, is often of an afterthought in organizations that we think about protecting our hardware and our software, forgetting that actually our employees and our humans are our assets too. So in many of the cybersecurity incident breaches that we see, quite a large number can be attributed to the human factor. This is why it is important to be able to have a process to educate your employees and make sure that they are cyber aware so that they don't become the whole uh, in, your cyber orga in your organization's shield of defense and they can help you to become your ears and eyes and the first line of defense in your organization. What CSA has done so far is to release a series of cybersecurity toolkits that can help businesses raise their awareness about cybersecurity. Earlier on, I gave some examples about business leaders and why they should think about cybersecurity culture and so on. 
some of these are taken off uh, the cybersecurity toolkits that we have for enterprise leaders as well as SME owners. Early on, I also talked about employees and how they should be the first line of defense for the organization. So for organizations that do not already have an active cybersecurity awareness program, uh, we would encourage you to download these toolkits and make this available to your employees, encourage them to read it and make sure that they are aware. Awareness is actually just the starting point and importantly is the need to be able to take action as well. Particularly for the smaller enterprises, sometimes they can be a bit more resource constrained and may not have um, dedicated IT teams to look into some of these. So what we're planning is a cybersecurity toolkit for IT teams in small enterprises. It would pack together a, a list of cyber hygiene measures prioritized so that if your IT teams are constrained, uh, they know which are the areas to focus on. We are also looking at putting together some free tools and resource, resources for enterprises as well. After we have taken you the awareness journey, the action journey, uh, now is to reward enterprises who have actually adopted good cybersecurity hygiene. And this is where we're coming up with a Mark of Cyber Hygiene as well as a Trustmark certification program. The Mark of Cyber Hygiene would be focused on smaller enterprises that may have limited expertise and resources. Uh, what we would help them do is to list um, some of the common cyber hygiene measures that would help them to be staying protected against the most common cyber attacks. This way, with this mark, it is a visible label and indicator to show that they have put in place the relevant cyber hygiene measures. For organizations that are larger, if you have gone beyond cyber hygiene, the trust mark uh, would be relevant to you. It is basically a mark of distinction and takes on a risk-based approach so that uh, it ensures that the measures that you put in place commensurates with your risk profile of your organization. Um, these marks, uh, we, hope them, we hope that they will become a competitive edge for you in business partnerships. Why do I say that? In the past year or so, we have seen um, a chain of supply chain attacks happening in the cyber industry. Um, usually in a supply chain attack, cyber attackers will tend to exploit um, a weaker player in the entire uh, supply chain. So even an organization who has taken active steps to protect themselves sometimes get exploited through a vulnerability uh, in their partner that they work with. Increasingly, we likely can expect to see that as companies uh, become more aware of cyber, um, cyber attacks in the supply chain, they would want to ask to see whether their partners that they're working with, whether you have a visible label or whether you have a certain mark to demonstrate that you actually have good cybersecurity practices in place. What I've mentioned so far are very much a government-led initiatives uh, driven by CSA in terms of developing cybersecurity toolkits as well as the certification program. But we do believe that cybersecurity is a collective responsibility and there's a lot of room for us to work with industry partners to walk this journey together. This is why we have also launched um, a partnership program which basically creates a platform for industry partners to join us and work together with us um, and we find areas to collaborate so that collectively we can raise the cyber posture of enterprises together. So I think in today's very quick sharing, I have in a nutshell outlined some of the early initiatives that CSA has in place for enterprises to help them be cyber safe. Please do reach out to us and keep in touch with us if you want to follow us on next and upcoming developments or if you have ideas on how we can collaborate to help enterprises stay cyber safe. Thank you very much. I've come to the end of my presentation. And with that, uh, I would hand over the virtual baton uh, over to Justin for him to continue the conversation with everyone. Justin, we, we can't hear you. Sorry, forgot to unmute. Classic error. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, as I was saying, good afternoon, everyone. Um, glad to be here today speaking to all of you. Um, I'm Justin. I'm a technology and data protection lawyer with Raja and Tan. Uh, and I'm here today as the appointed speaker from the PDPC uh, to, to share a little bit more about today's topic, which is strengthening organizational accountability with the amended PDPA. So this concept, okay, sorry, before that, let me, let me just quickly start with a brief overview and recap of what is the PDPA. So it was passed in 2012, um, came into effect in 2014, 
and broadly, it's the it's a general law that, that governs the collection, use, and disclosure of personal data by organizations. And the key thing is that it balances, on one hand, uh, the rights of individuals to, to protect the data and to, and to manage their own data uh, versus the commercial needs of organizations to use, uh, collect, and disclose the data for their own reasonable business purposes. Um, there was a, a, a set of the first major set of amendments to the PDPA, which was passed uh, end of 2020 and came into force at the start of this year. And the idea or the driving thinking behind this set of amendments was to further strengthen consumer autonomy, while at the same time, um, the other side of the balance, supporting businesses to use and harness data confidently. So the key principle that was driving all of these changes is really um, accountability. And this is part of a, a concerted push and effort funded by the PDPC uh, to shift organizations towards a purely compliance mindset um, towards achieving uh, or towards being closer to achieving true accountability in the, in the managing and handling of their uh, whatever personal data they have in their possession or control, whether it's their uh, customer's data, their employee data, um, whatever personal data they have. And the culmination of this push uh, was really reflected in the amendments to the PDPA, which came into effect in February this year. And, and, and this is what I'll be um, briefly going through in, 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 my, in my presentation today. So the amendments to the PDPA, uh, which, which came into force this year, as I mentioned, uh, can be sort of broken up into these four um, broad areas. And I'll, I'll go through each of these in turn. Um, I, won't, I won't go through all of them, but probably just the key highlights. Lah. Right, so the first thing I want to, to pick up on is the mandatory data breach notification, which was introduced as part of these amendments. Um, as Veronica mentioned, you know, when and, and whether an organization is, is, is going to be a, the, the victim of a, of a cyber breach or any, any other kind of data breach, it's really a matter of um, when rather than if, lah, right? So, so it's important to be aware if you suffer a data breach and the data breach affects personal data in your organization's possess, possession or control, um, there is an obligation to notify the PDPC of that data breach um, in two circumstances. The first is if the breach is one that is likely to result in significant harm to the affected individuals, um, or if the breach is one that is of a, of a significant scale. And significant scale in this case refers to a breach that involves the data of, of 500 or more individuals. Um, in the case of a breach that, that is of significant harm, there is additionally the obligation to also notify um, all of the affected individuals whose data was compromised. So in assessing whether a breach is likely to result in significant harm, um, this really has to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but the, 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 there has been a set of regulations published um, which sets out certain uh, circumstances in which the breach is deemed to result in significant harm. And this, these would be breaches where uh, there's a combination of data such that um, the data such that such that the breach will be will be deemed to result in significant harm, and, and the combination would be, um, for example, uh, where the where the breach involves the individual's full name or NRIC, um, together with other sen other sensitive data such as financial data, medical data, health insurance data, etc. Um, another set of deemed circumstances would be if the individual's account information was compromised, together with the password, bi biometric data security codes uh, associated with that account. So in these circumstances, the, 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 the breach is deemed to result in significant harm and the PDBC must be notified. In terms of timelines, um, this is critical um, because you know, it's important to, to be aware of what these timelines are so you can react quickly and, and within the appropriate timeline once the breach occurs. So once you suspect there is a breach, it's your duty to uh, promptly carry out investigations to figure out um, within 30 days, uh, whether the data breach is one that is notifiable to the PDPC or not. Um, if you are a data intermediary, and meaning that you process personal data on behalf of another organization, um, the obligation notify the obligation would be to notify that organization whose data you're processing uh, without delay. But if it's your data, you are the primary organization, your obligation is to, to assess the breach within 30 days. And once you've deemed the breach to be notifiable based on your assessment, um, there is a three calendar, three calendar day timeline within which you must submit a formal notification to the PDPC. Um, if, there's, and if there's also the obligation to notify the affected individuals, um, that will take place 
on or after um, your notification to the PDPC. But the next um, big amendment that came into force is really the enhanced framework to support data use. Um, this will take th th this will include the two new exceptions which were introduced: the business improvement and legitimate interest exception. Um, certain revised exceptions dealing with business asset transactions and research and development, as well as the broadened uh, concept of deemed consent in the in the circumstance of contractual performance on or notification. For the new exceptions, so as I mentioned, there are these two. Um, the business improvement exception was introduced to permit the use of personal data without consent um, when you're using that data to enhance goods or services, to improve your operational efficiencies, or to, to do things such as you know, understanding your customers better. So essentially to improve your business, improve the services you're offering. Um, in this circumstance, you're able to use the data. Um, collection disclosure is not covered here, but you're able to use the data um, of your customers or whoever uh, without their consent for these purposes. The second new exception which was introduced is the legitimate interest ex exception. This permits the collection, use, and disclosure of personal data without consent. Um, for the for as long as that as long as you can identify that that this collection, use, or disclosure is for a certain lawful interest of the organization or a certain segment of the public. Um, in this case, the an example for this case would be if, if certain hotels come together to share a blacklist of hotel skippers, so you know they, they, they just stay and then they run away uh, without paying for their, their hotel room. So in this case, there's a legitimate or lawful interest identified and, and, and the data can be collected, used and disclosed uh, without the consent of the relevant individuals. In, in both of these circumstances, or, or um, it's important to make sure that, 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 that you're not doing so um, for um, the purpose of direct marketing, um, because that's that's actually specifically excluded from the scope of this kind of uh, new exceptions. And in addition, um, if you're going to rely on the legitimate interest exception, there is a mandatory risk assessment, a data protection uh, impact assessment that you need to need to conduct um, in order to to ensure that your use, collection, and disclosure of the personal data without consent, um, the benefits of this outweigh the the adverse impact to the individuals involved. Right. So as I mentioned, there are also these revised exceptions. So these are existing exemptions which were broadened to, to, to better enable the, the, the um, use of personal data uh, by organizations for these uh, um, you know, specific purposes of business of, of a business asset transaction or for RD purposes. Um, yeah, I won't go to, I won't go into this into in, in too much detail, but uh, suffice to say, um, they've been broadened to permit a broader, broader set of purposes. Right, and the concept of deemed consent has also been um, broadened um, to recognize that, that there are other circumstances in which consent is deemed to be given by the individuals involved. Um, generally speaking, consent is deemed to be given if, the, if an individual had voluntarily given their data um, for a certain purpose, and it's reasonable that an individual would have um, volunteered their data for that purpose. Um, this has been broadened to include these two new sets of circumstances now. The first would be deemed consent by contractual performance, whereby um, the individual has entered into the contract, in, entered into a contract with um, an organization. Um, in doing so, any personal data disclosed in connection with that contract, um, the individual will have been deemed to, to have consented to his data being processed or disclosed um, for the purpose of executing or fulfilling that contract. The second new category that has been introduced in the concept of deemed consent will be deemed consent by notification. So this refers to a new mechanism whereby you can notify the individuals of certain uh, new purposes for which you intend to process their data. And if they, in, in, and you specify uh, a sort of uh, time and mode by which they're supposed to get back to you on that, on that um, particular new purpose. And if they don't get back to you within that time, they are deemed to have consented. So again, similar with the, the legitimate interest I mentioned, uh, legitimate interest exception I mentioned earlier, if you're going to rely on deemed consent by notification, that's also the obligation to conduct a risk assessment, a DPIA. Right, and the DNC provisions were also revised in this circumstance uh, uh, as part of these new amendments. Um, essentially, it was it, it, it broadened the 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 concept of deemed consent. I'm uh, not sorry, not deemed consent. Uh, the do not call regime. Sorry, uh, pardon me. 
So, so the do not call regime was, was modified in this circumstance um, to, to amend the validity of the uh, registry check. So previously it was 30 days, now it's been reduced to 21 days. So if you're, if you're conducting um, marketing via uh, voice call, text message, text message or fax message to, to, to Singapore phone numbers, you have to do your you have to do your your, your validity checks more often, and the 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 um, sending of messages via um, chat applications, for example, WhatsApp, WeChat, these kind of things, um, these are not covered under the DSC regime, but they have been amended. Uh, the the spam control has been amended to cover these as well. So, um, overall speaking, uh, the 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 concept of marketing has been has been greater protected um, based on these amendments. Right, the next set of amendments that, that, that I'm going to touch on is the, the concept of active enforcement framework that was introduced by the PDPC. Um, in order to incentivize account accountable practices, uh, the PDPC has recognized that instead of um, having a full investigation being carried out in all cases of data breach, uh, there are certain alternative enforcement options that can be uh, utilized by the PDPC if they feel that the circumstances warrant it. Um, so moving from left to right, um, in the blue box, that sets out the, 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 the sort of most favorable outcome for the organization whereby uh, the PDBC closes, closes the investigation without, without any further action. Uh, this is done in a, in a case whereby impact access has to be low. Like this. There isn't really any big breach involved here. Um, the middle two boxes are really the ones that were newly introduced um, by the PDPC. And, and these are circumstances whereby the, 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 the PDPC recognizes that um, the organization has in place accountable practices and is willing to either uh, permit the organization to, to, to submit a voluntary undertaking. So the in, in, instead of a finding of a liability, the organization undertakes to implement certain remediation measures to address the breach. Um, so the PDPC accepts that and moves on uh, and closes the case without a formal finding of liability in exchange for that uh, commitment to the voluntary undertaking. Um, alternatively, the organization could also apply for an expedited breach decision. Um, this occurs when the, the, the breach is, is one that's similar to, to previous PDPC cases, um, in which case the organization uh, admits the breach involved. Um, and because of the admission, the PDPC agrees to, to close the breach, uh, to close the investigation earlier. And um, Usually, this will be taken as a strong mitigating factor in uh, the PDP's imposition of a lower penalty uh, on the organization in this case. Uh, and finally, the red box is really your, 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 your uh, typical final outcome of, a, of an investigation where there's a breach. The impact has been assessed by the PDBC and, and the PDBC issues a formal enforcement decision with, with penalties, etc. So, you know, what, what I mentioned earlier was kind of the, the, the carrot end of the, 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 the equation whereby the PDPC encourages accountable practices um, by giving organizations a, a way to, to uh, close investigations um, in, in a more favorable way if they, are, if they can demonstrate their accountability. Uh, on the thick end of things, um, the, the, the PDP amendments also included uh, a set of higher financial penalties that can be imposed by the PDPC. Um, the, the, the penalty cap has been increased from $1 million to include up to 10% of the organization's annual turnover, uh, whichever is higher. So if let's say your organization's annual turnover in Singapore is greater than $10 million, um, then the penalty can be potentially be above $1 million. Um, this increased penalty cap, even though it's been passed, uh, the PDBC has, has, has said that it won't take effect until February next year, like, but that's pretty soon. So it's going to come into effect soon. Um, there's also been new offenses in, uh, introduced under the amended PDPA for individuals. So this would refer to such situations where employees had egregious, egregiously mishandled data um, based on the fact that they knew or they were reckless to the fact that whatever they were doing in terms of the data processing or disclosure of personal data was not actually authorized by the company. In such cases, uh, there is a potential for criminal liability to impose on these individuals. Right, so that kind of summarizes the key highlights of the amended PDPA. Um, there, I just want to, to, to draw your attention to the fact that there are resources that the PDBC has on its website to assist the, the organizations in, in, in 
um, achieving greater accountability under the amended PDPA. Uh, this will include advisory guidelines, EDMs and infographics, and various other help and resources that are available on the PDP's website. So, you know, I, I, in the interest of time, I can't go through all of these, but um, suffice to say, you should go to the website to, to explore all these helpful resources if you, if you feel that you, you need certain help with these things. Right, so that brings me to the end of my portion. Um, I will hand the session over to Dominic to talk about the Data Protection Trust. Thanks, Justin. Wait, just let me share my screen first. And... Voila. Okay, I would believe that everyone can see my slides. If not, please let me know. Hi, my name is Dominic from IMDA's Data Protection Certification Team. And uh, thank you, SICC, for having me here, for the rest of us as well. Uh, and just to share about our IMDA's Data Protection Certifications. IMDA, we administer three certifications, our domestic certification, the Data Protection Trust Mark, as well as two other APEC certifications, the APEC Cross-Border Privacy Rules, as well as the APEC Privacy Recognition for Processor. Okay, so first of all, uh, for both, all three sets, IMDA started uh, administering them in 2019, so relatively young certification in the certification market. And I'll go through very briefly all three certifications today. But first and foremost, I need to paint you a picture of why IMDA decided to go on this uh, designing this data protection trust mark as well as becoming the accountability agent for the two other APEC certifications. For IMDA, in terms of where data privacy is heading to, we believe that there are three major categories. Okay, First and foremost, consumers are increasing demand for more privacy. We're dealing with consumers who are educated, more and more educated, who understand their rights under the various laws, especially the PDPA. I'm not sure about you, uh, but I do hear a lot of organizations mention that they do get a lot of uh, queries on, uh, by their consumers on, hey, you know, how are you using my data? How are you using my personal data? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that takes up a lot of time. Number two, digitalization leading to data overload. The very fact that we're having this session here uh, on the virtual space is a clear testament of where we are heading towards. We are in society, uh, the economy is becoming more digitalized, people are adopting more digitalized, uh, digital tools. Uh, and that leads to a collection, more collection of personal data. And as IMDA, we encourage organizations to harness the power of data, to use data for, for example, your business analytics and all that. But at the same time, you need to also ensure an environment of trust on how you manage personal data. And number three, increasing number of data breaches. This is a nightmare word, especially if you are a DPO, right? Uh, and uh, recently in the news, I believe you, if you are following the news, there have been uh, quite a few uh, cases of data breaches. Uh, recently, there was one case, uh, Com Measure, Red Doors, that suffered a data breach. Uh, and what I understand is that 5.9 million records were lost, uh, was, uh, lost in the data breach. And this is so far the highest amount of data breach, uh, personal data loss in a data breach uh, ever to be suffered in Singapore uh, under the PDPA, when the PDPA has been enacted, which uh, Justin mentioned was in 2012. Okay, it's even higher than the Singh Health breach of uh, uh, 1.6 million, I believe the number. Yep, and they were slapped with a fine of $74,000. Okay, so we believe that, look, we don't think it's going to drop the number of data breaches. In fact, it's going to increase. And again, uh, with the PDP amendment, we're going to look at an increased uh, penalty in terms of financial penalty. Okay, so these are the three points, but there is a fourth point, okay, where it's not all gloom and doom. It's really about how organizations can demonstrate that they are accountable by making sure that they, they pay attention to the data privacy where they see data privacy as a business differentiator, and especially in this day and age in the digital economy. And therefore, IMDA, we came up with, first and foremost, our domestic certification, a data protection trust mark. Okay? If, you are, if you were to note in my presentation, I try not to use the word audit okay, because it's not really an audit. It, looks, it seems like an audit, it feels like an audit, but in the spirit of things, it is not an audit. Okay? The aim of this data protection trust mark is to help establish and recognize robust data governance standards to help business increase the competitive advantage and build trust with their clients. Four key objectives. Number one, 
through the Data Protection Trust, organizations can demonstrate their compliance to the PDPA and to encourage accountability in the organization. Objective two, to provide a competitive advantage for businesses in the digital economy. And number three, as a result, to boost consumers' confidence in how they manage personal data. Last but not least, we aspire the Trustmark to be a, a, a gold standard, okay, if you put it that way, a way that organizations can take on, can adopt to show their clients, to show their business partners that they have good, they have sound, robust data protection practices. So the Data Protection Trust Mark, it is an enterprise-wide certification that looks at an organization's data protection policies, processes, and practices, and it is valid for three years. As of today, we're happy to announce that we have uh, certified 70 organizations. Okay, so two days ago, we certified one more, uh, and this number is growing. I believe some of you would find some of this, uh, your company here, okay? Uh, definitely some of you, uh, your eyes will go towards the, the big names, right? AIG is there, uh, DBS is there, M1, Starhub, and major banks and telcos are certified. A majority of them are also SMEs, in fact, small medium enterprises. We do, in fact, have a few charities as well. Because at the end of the day, if you are a private organization in Singapore, if you need to comply with the PDPA, this data protection trust mark will be something very useful, very beneficial for you as an organization. Now, Data Protection Trust Mark Certification Standard, we developed it based on, of course, our own PDPA, the Data Protection Obligations, but we took it one step further. We incorporated international benchmarks and best practices, data protection laws from other jurisdictions, like for, for example, Australia, the Hong Kong, the EU GDPR, as well as international benchmarks like the OECD guidelines and the APEC Privacy Framework to come up with four key principles of Singapore's Data Protection Trust Bank. And they are, first of all, we look at principle one, governance and transparencies, whether, whether the organization has the appropriate data protection policies in place and practices implemented. For example, do you have a data breach management plan? Do you conduct risk assessment? And importantly, whether these policies and practices are communicated to your stakeholders, both internal and external. Number two, we look at management of personal data. We will assess whether the organization obtains the appropriate consent to collect, use, and disclose personal data for the appropriate purposes notified to individuals. Number three, care of personal data. Now that you have policies, yes, you have the uh, legitimate mechanisms uh, to collect, consent, et cetera, et cetera. We look at how you then protect the personal data that is held by you as an organization. So we look at whether you have the appropriate information security measures in place, whether you have a retention policy to govern how long you can keep, for example, a customer's personal data uh, with you. And if there is no more legitimate reasons, no more legal or business reasons to hold on to the data, how do you then dispose of the data? And with the data on hand, do you ensure that it is accurate and complete? Because the last thing you want to have is uh, data that's not clean, right? To use the word, it's not clean and that would affect your other processes, your business analytics and all that. Last but not least, individual, individual's rights. We look at whether the organization provides for withdrawal consent, uh, access and correction of personal data by individuals. Now, benefits. Organizations ask, why should I go for a certification like this? What are the benefits that I can enjoy? Okay, so we we collected the feedback from all our certified organizations. We asked them, so, you know, how have you been enjoying the certification? And they shared these five points. First and foremost, all of them agree that the biggest benefit, it provides assurance. Why? The Data Protection Trust Fund was designed and developed together with the regulators. So we sat down with the PDPC. We asked them, okay, what do you think would, uh, how an organization, what are the requirements an organization must meet to demonstrate that they have good, they have sound data protection standards? And they came out with a list of requirements. And using this list, organizations would then conduct uh, this uh, assessment with their assessment body. And if there are any gaps, any areas for improvement identified, all this will be highlighted to the organization. Uh, and this uh, assessors will share best practices as well that the organization can then remediate and, and patch up things, improve themselves. Number two, it raises business competitiveness. Uh, many of my organizations shared that not just locally, but uh, uh, internationally, the Trust Fund has helped them, uh, to, has given them the competitive advantage uh, when it comes to dealing with uh, external parties uh, in terms of contract negotiation, uh, data protection negotiation, for example, to, to demonstrate the quality of the organization's data protection standard. This has helped them. 
significantly. And number three, strengthen customers' trust with the trust mark. Okay, before we go there, trust. Trust is something so important. You can take many years, resources, time, effort to build up your trust, but all it takes is one incident, two incidents to, to bring down your reputation, to bring down that trust. And uh, organizations have shared that at the end of the day, while yes, they are afraid of the financial penalty. I mean, if you get, get uh, if you are found to have breached the PDPA, yes, the financial penalty can be quite worrisome, uh, uh, worrying. Yeah, but what they fear most is the reputational fallout. Okay, imagine uh, your name appearing in a newspaper. Next day, your stakeholders will be calling you and hey, where's this going? What, why, what's happening? You know, uh, crisis comes. You have to engage experts to come and can help to re reduce um, the crisis fallout, basically. And all these things organizations fear the most. Number four, demonstrate accountability to regulators. As uh, Justin pointed out in the active enforcement framework, if you are data protection trust mark certified, and you encounter a data breach, what happens is that you can request from the PDPC the option of undertaking. And uh, you know, undertaking, right? So if the undertaking is given, granted, you must then show that you are able to put in place your remediation plan, your data breach plan, for example. And if done properly, then it will be a mitigating factor. It will be a strong mitigating factor in your investigation. Last but not least, increases overseas market access. This trust part will help you expand overseas because of the reputation. Because the trust part is administered by the government of Singapore, so it brings along with it reputation, uh, stringent quality control rule of law to help better assure overseas clients, business partners, even regulators that the certified organization has good standards. Sorry. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about the APEC cross-border privacy rules, CBPR, as well as the privacy recognition for processes. Okay, the trust part is uh, domestic certification currently only recognized in Singapore, okay? Recognized uh, officially, okay? Uh, but of course, it enjoys certain benefits. For the CBPR, PRP, these two certifications are useful if you are an organization that transfers a lot of uh, personal data across border, okay? Especially in the APEC region. The whole idea of the CBPR, PRP, they are designed, are developed by the APEC economies to bridge different privacy laws, to reduce barriers and to build consumer, business and regulator trust in the cross-border flows of personal information. The CBPR. The CBPR is designed for data controllers. If you're responsible for the handling of the personal data, the collection, use and disclosure of personal data, then the CBPR would make sense for you as an organization. The PRP, this is designed so that data controllers can identify trusted data processes. Okay, let's just put it that way. Okay, so data processes or data intermediaries under the PDP context, we use the term data intermediaries, but of course, GDPR, they use data processes. To demonstrate that uh, you as a DI, you are able to comply with the relevant privacy obligations, right? The security safeguard as well as the accountability obligation under the APEC privacy framework. Um, this APEC CBPR PRP, I, I think at this point, I would like to say that the key difference between this and the Trustmark is that, of course, Trustmark is a domestic certification enterprise, right? For the CBPR PRP, they have specific assessment scopes. They will look at the specific data that has been transferred out of your organization across borders, of course, uh, and the systems and policies surrounding the transfer of that identified personal data. Okay, for Trustmark, Data Protection Trustmark, that is designed that would certify legal entities, by legal entity, okay? And it doesn't really cover subsidiaries. But for the CBPR and PRP, yes. If you have subsidiaries and if you're HQ in Singapore, yes, your subsidiaries can also participate in the certification. Uh, for the CBPR, PRP, certification validity is for one year. Okay, so of course the benefits largely similar to what I shared about the data protection trust mark. So of course it shows that you uh, if you have a CBPR or PRP certification, you're in compliance with the APEC privacy framework, and therefore you build trust and confidence, especially overseas uh, business partners, regulators as well. Okay? And this will lead to a reduction in cost and time when it comes to, to uh, privacy negotiation, for example. What we mean by that is when you need to show your overseas clients that you have good standards in place when it comes to privacy, all you need to say that is, I am certified with the cross-border privacy rules. And it will also demonstrate good faith compliance with overseas regulators because, as, uh, well, especially if they're in the APEC region, uh, because all APEC economies, 21 economies would know what this is about. 
what the CBPR is about. And wow, having a CBPR doesn't mean that you comply with the local privacy laws. It would tell the overseas regulators that as you have a CBPR, which also means that you are meeting the APEC privacy framework uh, obligations, it will give them a little bit more trust that you are in good shape. Okay, and for CBPR PRP, we Singapore, we recognize it under our PDPA as a legitimate transfer mechanism, meaning that uh, if an overseas recipient is CBPR PRP certified, then uh, organizations in Singapore can then easily transfer personal data to this overseas recipient without meeting additional requirements. Okay, so certification process, very briefly, I will quickly share about this for both Trustmark and CBPR PRP. Uh, application is done online. There will be a course which I'll talk about later. After that, you can appoint, you will need to appoint an assessment body. Once your application has been approved, you appoint an assessor. Uh, five assessors here, they have been appointed by IMDA. You can select one of them. And once you've selected the assessment body, you can pro proceed to conduct an assessment. There will be an, a desktop assessment of your policies, of your uh, practices, review of your records, for example. And after that, there will be an on-site assessment where organizations will then need to show the assessors, how are you uh, carrying out these policies on the ground? And if there are any gaps identified, then the assessors will highlight to you and give you the opportunity to remediate yourself, to improve yourself. And once the remediation is, is done, the assessors are satisfied that you have met the requirements, you will then be awarded the relevant certification. Okay, so application, there are two fees involved, application fee of $535 payable to IMDA, as well as an assessment fee payable to the assessment body of your choice. Assessment, for, uh, assessment fee would largely depend on the size of an organization. Okay, so if you're a big company with a high annual revenue, then of course, uh, we're looking at a more, uh, more expensive thing. Okay, but just to give you an idea of how much it would cost, a typical SME would range somewhere between five to six K, typical SM, right? Will range between five to six K. However, because there are just uh, many moving parts in this, uh, our advice is if you really want to know how much it will cost your organization, feel free to talk to one of the assessment bodies. They will be able to provide you with a non-obligatory quotation. Okay, and of course, the next question, we talk about costs. Are there any funding support? Yes, under the Enterprise Singapore Enterprise Development Grant, organizations who are eligible, uh, meeting the three requirements here can tap on this EDG funding. And this EDG funding will cover the assessment fee, assessment costs, as well as any third-party consultancy fee if you wish to engage a third-party consultant to help beef up your standards. And this is my last slide. Uh, feel free to visit our website, find out more about our three certifications. We also publish a series of success stories of our certified organization. Why did they go for certification and how have they benefited from it? Okay, feel free to drop me a call, uh, drop me an email or give me a call. More than happy to answer any queries. Or if you have any queries now, feel free to let me know during the Q&A. And if not, I've come to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. And I believe I'll hand this time back to Victor. Dominic, thank you very much. And my thanks to, to Justin and Veronica as well. Uh, those were three very engaging and inform informative presentations. Thank you very much. Um, you, spoke, you spoke a little bit about um, the assessment process, Dominic. Can you maybe give us a bit more color on what that is actually like for, say, a small business? Okay. So you said it starts with a desktop assessment of yes. whether there's an IT policy in place, yes. whether, there is a, um, whether there's a data protection um, policy in place, and how that's administered and how that is disseminated across um, or within the company, within the SME. All right. What else can you sort of help us understand a bit more about the assessment portion of this? Okay, so there are two, two steps to this. So first of all, I mentioned there will be a desktop assessment. Desktop assessment, there is a list of questions that the organization must answer. Okay, so just to give you a flavor of the questions asked, uh, do you have, for example, the simplest, do you have a data protection officer? Okay, that's the first one, followed up by questions like, uh, are there any training done for this data protection officer? Do you have a data protection uh, team 
in place in, in your organization, for example. So we look at all these questions and then the, the organization must then show evidences. Okay, you can't just say, yes, I have a DPO. You need to show evidences. Uh, if you say that you have a robust data protection policies addressing the 10 obligations of the PDPA, you need to show that policy. Of course, uh, we will treat it as confidential material or rather the assessment body will treat it as confidential material. Uh, but you need to show, you can't say that I have a, a data protection policy, uh, but sorry, it's somewhere I can't find it. You can't say that. <laughs> you have to show it. Right. Right. So, so all these things. Um, and uh, we also look at things like, for example, uh, there are a few key areas we look at. Data breach management plan. Okay. I believe one of the questions people would ask is, if I have the trust map, would that mean that I would have zero data breach? It doesn't work that way. Okay, if anybody can can sell, if anybody can sell me a program or tool or a standard can guarantee you free from cyber attacks, free from data breach, I'm more than happy to talk to you about it. Okay, but unfortunately, no. So we believe yes, uh, trust fund certified organizations uh, would still suffer data breach. It's possible, uh, but the idea of the trust fund is to mitigate it, of course. Uh, so we look at whether you have a data breach management plan, whether you have a effective communication plan, or join up. Do you do tabletop exercises? You can have the best plans, but if your staff have no idea how to carry it out, uh, it's as good as nothing, right? But so, so these are the desktop assessment done. Okay? So the assessors will look, do you have all these things in place? The, uh, how are you meeting the requirements? And you have to explain how are you meeting the requirements. For the on-site, it would be a little bit more of uh, making sure that your policies have been practiced by your organization. So I give you a classic example. If you say that your organization has a clean desk policy, what the assessors will do is that they will walk your ground, walk the office, uh, and if they find out that look, uh, you know, there's confidential documents all over the table, and uh, the person, uh, the the desk owner is at lunch, well, there is something that to be highlighted to the organization. So that, that's that's a key. Uh, and as well as talking to people, just to understand if if they are familiar with the process, that if they were to encounter a suspected data breach, they were to identify a suspected data breach, do they know who to talk to? Yeah, so these things will be all, all be done as part of the on-site assessment. And um, one last thing, because this is a data protection certification, okay, what we are really concerned with would be the policies. Okay, we'll be concerned with the policies, we will be concerned Importantly, is how are these policies being implemented? Right, it should translate to practices. Mm. Uh, uh, we won't. We will look a little at uh, the the information security, cyber security aspect things, but we won't drill into the details. Number one, okay. So, uh, to us is for example, okay, just give you a simple example. Uh, if you have a public facing website that collects personal data, do you conduct uh, VAPT, uh, vulnerability assessment penetration test? Okay, we won't scrutinize the reports. We will just make sure that yes, you do it. And how often do you do it? Is it in your policy? Right. So we look at that. Yep. Uh, and yep, that's it. So don't worry. And uh, we won't access live data. Right. So don't worry about it. We won't <laughs> access your customer's personal data. So don't worry about that. Especially if those from the banking sector, right? So don't worry. Okay, that's great. And typically how long does that assessment process take? Okay. You know, uh, mm. I know each business is, is is structured differently and there may be there may be some gaps that yes. need time to be mitigated or plugged yes. but in in sort of for those 70 companies that you've that you have currently um awarded the the trust mark to how how long does the whole thing take okay on average on average uh, based on all the certified organizations the process the entire certification process from start to finish takes about six to nine months on average. Okay, on average. Um, the assessment itself, okay, when the assessment body looks at your, your uh, when they conduct documentation review as well as the on-site assessment, generally takes somewhere between two to four months. Right, so the additional months, okay, so two to four months, but the whole process is six to nine months. The additional months, uh, you need to factor in things like uh, administrative, right? Application, uh, selection of assessment body, all these are factored in. And like what you rightly pointed out, there would be some time given for remediation. Okay? So far, so far, of all the 70 companies, every single one of them had to do some kind of remediation. Okay, Of course, it, may, it wouldn't be severe. I mean, you have uh, the simple ones to the more onerous ones. Uh, but all in all, Time will be given, uh, that will be factored in, and 
if your organization is confident, okay, this is for organizations uh, who have applied in the, in the first place. The readiness of your organization will also help to determine how long it will take. Because when I talk about readiness, it means that uh, if your organization, you are confident that you comply with the PDPA, you are confident that you have data protection policies in place. Uh, uh, one quick example is, for example, if your GDPR compliant, okay, so, so for example, so all these things you have in place, you're confident, then I would say that, yes, uh, it may possibly cut down the, the amount of time needed for the assessment and certification process. Okay, thank you very much, Dominic. Appreciate that. If I can now turn to Veronica. Veronica, you mentioned in your presentation that, your, uh, that the agency, the Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore is keen to build partnerships. Can you maybe just talk a little bit more and amplify your top, your, your comments in terms of what sort of partnerships are you looking to build? And um, could you maybe give us an example of the output from one of those partnerships? Okay, so I think uh, so far after we have launched the partnership program, I would uh, put the category of partners into uh, two major categories. Uh, one major category would be the technology or solutions pro providers. And usually they'll be quite keen with us to create something synergistic. For example, earlier on, I mentioned uh, our efforts on the mark of cyber hygiene, uh, where we will outline a certain basic cyber hygiene that enterprises would have to put in place for certification. So these technology partners are, are quite keen to work together to um, either stitch together a turnkey service offering that sort of uh, encapsulates all these measures, or in some cases, these are single product um, companies, so they would want to make sure that this specific product that they have uh, is generally in alignment with what our requirements are for the company. So that in a way, by buying this product, this part of the requirement is so-called taken care of or baked in by the service. Uh, that's one type of partnership. The other one is in the area of, I think, trade associations. Um, the other major category of partners we have are with the trade associations simply because many of the trade associations um, either focus on a specific sector or a specific um, I'll say genre of companies, and they all generally have this um, uh, charter to um, enable uh, capability building within the membership. So in our case, working with us is obviously in the area of cybersecurity capability building, and we we'll work together on outreach programs so that we are able to bring cybersecurity capabilities and knowledge to some of their uh, members, whether it's uh, enterprises or individuals. So I think in a nutshell, these are the two major categories. There is one other category, which are companies that are not really uh, in any of these um, uh, you know, categories. Some of them would be, for example, cyber insurers. Um, we have uh, realized that cyber insurance is also um, a growing area of interest because I think there's common synergies. Insurers are uh, keen to ensure that their customers put in place cyber hygiene measures before they underwrite. Uh, and on our end, obviously, as an agency, we are also keen to make sure that companies have the right cybersecurity posture. So this is one example of uh, something which um, uh, we can work on together, even though they're not the traditional technology company, simply because they're common areas of interest. That's, that's great. And it's, it's good to hear that this is all happening. Um, there's, a kind of a, there's, there's a kind of a related question here from Richard, uh, who says he's interested to hear whether, uh, you know, the big, uh, the, the big data houses, SAP, Google, Meta, <laughs> Apple, and Microsoft have Trustmark certification. Um, and the reasons for that, because he says they're handling almost all of private data one way or another in Singapore. Okay. Uh, the short answer to that is for the following names mentioned here, no, they are not Trustmark certified. Okay. And, but I do have a caveat, uh, rather a follow-up answer to that is that uh, we do have uh, quite a few organizations that have applied and undergoing the certification assessment. But unfortunately, due to confidentiality, I cannot share their names. But the rest assured that definitely there are some big names inside, right? So once they get certified, then we will, uh, we will put them on the pedestal and sing their praises. But before that, uh, it has to be hush hush, you know, because some of them may decide that uh, during uh, once they apply, they may feel that okay, I don't think I want to complete due to perhaps change in priorities or or that, and they may withdraw. Possible, possible. Okay, that, that's, that's, that's fair enough and perfectly understandable. But maybe you could answer the, the second bit of that question. Um, uh, you know, why, why would some of these big players want to get this 
uh, the trust mark certification? Okay, fantastic question. The reason for a lot of these big companies, okay, and these are uh, stories I hear from them. So once you get certified, uh, generally we do have a chit chat with you just to find out a little bit more why you go for certifications. Uh, some of the, most of them agree that this trust mark certification, oh, okay, we're talking about big companies here, right? So yeah. I'm using the example of, for example, the banks, the telcos and all that. Uh, majority of them say that uh, they have confidence Okay, in their data protection posture, they have confidence in their practices or policies, uh, but they want to put it to the test, right? They want to put it to the test based on a set of requirements that was jointly developed with the PDPC, right? So uh, if you really want to test out your system, go to the regulators, <laughs> right? Just ask them, okay, you know, uh, how can I assess my own self based on your standards, right? So, so this is a, a wonderful opportunity for organizations, big companies, then uh, put their own data protection policies and practice, practices to the test. Uh, and uh, I, I heard from one of the banks, okay, I won't name which bank, but they actually said that, look, uh, they have full confidence in the way they protect data. So they invite us to come and try to poke holes in their, their policy, their practices. And well, we managed to do it, okay, and you know, we had <laughs> back and forth and all that. Uh, but at the end of the day, it, it's, it's, uh, it's positive, right? It's positive. We're not there to find fault, we just help there to, okay, you know, you say you have it, we're here to help you identify any weak spots. And we found, well, not a lot, just uh, one or two, but, uh, uh, but they were thankful for that. Yeah, because again, we are not looking at non-compliance. We are also looking at areas that you can improve yourself. So it may not be non-compliance, but you can do better. And then we will tell you, okay, this is how you can do better. And they, they are appreciative for it. So yes, uh, big companies, yes, please go for it. Uh, uh, and especially, you know, just uh, to demonstrate to your consumers, uh, that yes, uh, because you are a big company, you handle a lot of personal data, you have what it takes to protect the personal data. Thanks, Dominic. And of course, uh, it, it's, it's, always, um, it, it's always true to say that a business, I mean, can make all sorts of claims for itself. Yep. But if a third party, um, either through a trust mark or similar process, goes to the trouble of verifying it, then at least they can say, well, look, don't just take our word for it, take the word of, you know, the, the government of Singapore in this case, for example. Exactly. Yeah, so that, that's, that, that's a very strong, uh, strong message to give. Um, Justin, um, coming to you, I, I think that um, it's fair to say, and I hope you would agree that the amendments to the uh, PDPA uh, were are really well thought through. Because you can see, uh, and this is, I think, the, one of the strengths of your presentation, you can see how people have thought about the what if scenarios, you know, having lived with the, the act for a few years, they realize, well, you know, let's get clarity on what if I do this. And uh, well, the other thing that I liked about it was the way it, the, the, those sort of what if scenarios are directly linked to the growth of digitalization in the economy. But would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely, Victor. Um, so, you know, this, this, this set of amendments was, was really the first set of major amendments that, that took place since the inception of the PDPA, like seven years ago. Mm. Um, and the amendments were really put forward after uh, extensive industry consultation by the PDPC, as well as uh, quite importantly, um, consideration of what other, other jurisdictions or other regulators are doing across the world. Uh, I think a lot of inspiration was drawn from um, other data protection regimes, including those in Europe, um, US, and other, you know, other uh, jurisdictions with robust data protection uh, regulations. So, you know, I think, I think the PDBC in, in considering these amendments, they really looked at, at what other people are doing and picked and choose uh, the things that really work in the Singapore context. Um, that achieve the, the, the continued balance between the individual's rights on one hand and the business needs on the other hand. Mm -hmm. so, so I think if you see, we, we, we didn't like wholesale mirror everything from, from the GDPR, for example, but we took certain things like legitimate interest from them and implemented into the Singapore framework as an exception rather than as additional base for processing data um, so that it still fits in the Singapore context. But yes, absolutely, Victor. Um, I, think, I think these amendments really uh, reflect a, a, a kind of, um, forward thinking updating of the PDPC uh, of the PDPA by the PDPC uh, to reflect and to to ensure that it remains up to date in, in today's digital economy. 
Yeah, I mean, I just think it was all it's really impressive. Um, Justin, there's another question that came through earlier for you, um, and that is, um, you know, does an organization have to comply with data breach notification, its obligation to do so, if that data breach occurred before the 1st of February this year? Uh, okay, so so I think I think short answer is, is no. Uh, the, 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 the law does not apply uh, retroactively. So presumably the breach would have occurred and, and have been resolved already. Lah. It's not a continuing breach that, that, that has been ongoing since February until now. So uh, if, if, if it's something in the past, uh, there's no obligation to notify. Um, it, it really, it, it's really starting from when the amendments took, took, took forth in February this year. Yeah, that's very good to know. Um, there's one question. I should have, I should have said that um, I, I prefer short questions, <laughs> but there's one very long question from John here. So let me see if I can, uh, I can sort of navigate my way through it. Uh, and John, thank you for the question. We, we, we like all questions. So in cybersecurity, John says, it's got many aspects of protecting data. Each security solution, um, DLP, which I don't know what that means, web application, patch management, et cetera, is subscription-based, and it's pretty expensive depending on the volume and size. Um, there's some grant for the first year for certain approved items. And what if some providers are not on this grant list? Can they be considered for a grant application? Who wants to take that particular question? Uh, I, okay, at least from IMDA, um, when we talk about grant, okay, uh, Veron, this one you can add on, right? Just, just if you have any thoughts on this, but at least for IMDA, I understand that IMDA, there is a program called SME School Digital. And under this SME Go Digital, there is actually what we call a pre a list of pre-approved solution, pre-approved solutions. That uh, if an organization, okay, well, in this in this case, it will be an SME who wish to go for grant, okay, under they call this the productivity solution grant PSG, uh, that has been that is administered by the Enterprise Singapore. If you were to go for this grant, then you are able to select a list of pre-approved solutions. So, so a quick answer to number one is that uh, providers, unfortunately, it has to be on this list. Okay, if you're tapping on the grant, okay, and this is specifically for the SMEs Go Digital uh, mm -hmm. under the PSG, you have to tap, you have to get the provider, or rather the provider has to be on the list in order to proceed. Okay, so in this case, if the provider, service provider is not on this list, uh, then you cannot, they cannot be considered for a grant application. So if you ask me, then what can I do about this? Well, get your solution provider to be listed then. <laughs> right, so, so that's how, there are ways to, to, to be listed. So yeah, feel free to get them to do it. Okay, so yeah. So for question two, unfortunately, I'm not so familiar. I'm not so sure. Um, and uh, same thing for question three as well. I mean, of course, when you say check as in landscape, I would believe uh, the state of the union, right? state of your organization, uh, what is it like? Definitely, they will do that. There's a gap analysis and all that. But future landscape, I'm not so familiar unless it is tagged to a certain uh, standard. For example, uh, I, I understand that some of our trust fund consultants, what they do is that they will do a comparison where what is your state of readiness uh, uh, as compared to meeting the requirements of the trust fund. Then that they can do, right? Because again, future landscape, that is quite subjective, right? Um, and then number four, for a bridge, the company may not be able to have the expertise to get assistance for forensic. Um, hmm, uh, unfortunately, I'm not familiar. I'm not sure. Uh, but I would say, don't come to a point where you have to ponder this question, right? So try not to have a bridge. Okay, well, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dominic. Um, uh, Veronica, you have anything to add on any of these questions from John? So I think Dominic gave a, a very good attempt to the response. I think generally, if you ask most of us, uh, we would point to the SME School Digital Scheme, which is uh, administered by, uh, well, Dominic's colleagues in IMDA, but it actually takes on um, funding from ESG, which is why uh, some of the rules also have to follow ESG's grant program. Uh, in the area of cybersecurity, we do work with uh, the IMDA SME School Digital team uh, on the pre-approval of solutions. So I think generally, CSA plays a role in looking at the technology aspects 
of the solution, whereas the SME goes digital team looks at it from the perspective of the solution provider, the business model, um, the commercial model, and so on. Um, maybe just to uh, augment a little bit on the question two uh, of the question about VAPT, um, there are four categories uh, for cyber solution um, inside the pre-approved list. Um, although there is not a defined uh, category for VAPT, um, under the category of managed detection and response, some of these are actually security as a services provider. And because they are a security as a services provider, chances are they will be able to provide a sub element of this. So hopefully this helps, um, Yeah, even if the category is not literally listed there. Thank you. And for my benefit, what does VAPT mean, Veronica? A vulnerability assessment and penetration testing. My goodness, thank you very much. <laughs> We're an acronym central here. <laughs> okay, let me just uh, toggle to my uh, other screen on some other questions that came in earlier. Um, Veronica, this is for you. Will, will there be products or services to help enterprise meet the mark of cyber hygiene or the trust mark? Yeah, I think I sort of uh, addressed this earlier when you asked me about the partnership program. So the answer is yes, we are working with an ecosystem of partners to do that. Uh, we also realized that particularly for the smart of cyber hygiene, which targets a smaller enterprise, uh, typically the word uh, certification and standards and the small enterprise is not so congruous. So you give them a long document, it's quite difficult for them. So what makes it a bit easier if, if we were to lower the barrier and work directly with the solution providers so that the products are already there and the solution provider that can help uh, enterprises to hold their hand. So at least there's choice for the enterprises. If you prefer to read the document and basically assemble a best of breed based on you know, your own preference, um, you can do so. But if you prefer to outsource it to somebody and help you with the role, then obviously we want to create that option as well. Thank you very much. That's very clear and very helpful. Um, th there, are, there are no other uh, questions in the box, so um, I, I think we can draw this uh, really good session to a close. I want to thank each of you, Veronica, D Justin and Dominic, for your time and for sharing your expertise. Uh, I mean, this is a topic that's of central interest to every single business, because all of us depend uh, one way or another on systems and all our customers um, and our vendors, suppliers, and of course our good government are all, are all depending on good systems that are protected and that we have good policies in place to protect the data that we process. So thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure to have you. Um, thank you too to the audience for your questions. And I wish you all a very good afternoon and even better, a great weekend ahead. Um, if there's anything we can do to help uh, our members, please just contact us at here to help at siccom.sg. And that includes um, requests or suggestions for coverage of topics or themes in webinars or events. And of course, we look forward very much to returning to in-person events uh, in 2022. But for now, from all of us, uh, including our expert speakers, it's goodbye from SICC. Thank you so much for being with us and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Thank you.